Okay, yeah, thanks very much uh, for the introduction and also for the invitation to um, present my work here at this uh, workshop. Um, so unfortunately, I, I cannot be in Vienna now, which is always uh, a nice place to be. I uh, spent there quite some part of my career uh, as a postdoc at the University of Vienna. Um, okay, so this uh, talk will be about, um, yeah, uh, deep learning or deep neural networks and particular on the optimization aspect. So um, it's not, well, directly related to um, high dimensional parametric PDEs, but um, but I'm aware that um, some of you are actually also looking into um, deep learning techniques for, for high dimensional parametric PDEs. And if you want to um, adapt your neural network your, um, to, well, to solving PDEs, at some point you need to do this optimization step. And uh, so the question, I mean, you have a non-convex problem and then it's always the question what you actually uh, get and the, at the end. Um, so where do you converge to and, and, and so on. So I'm, um, I'm trying to address uh, this, uh, this problem, of course, um, I mean, in general, there's, I mean, we had really, I mean, we did not really understand this uh, completely, but, but I hope that nevertheless, I, I can bring a little bit of insights uh, in, a, in a special case. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, you see that my talk has, uh, well, 49 slides, so I probably I will skip over some of them, um, but let's let's see. So um, yeah, so the general question in deep learning is, yeah, what, I mean, it's working quite well, so I didn't put any examples now, but I guess everybody of you has some examples in mind. Um, and so the question is, can we understand actually what's what's going on here? Why is this this working very well? And uh, so can we understand the inner workings of deep learning or um, what can we actually prove about deep learning? And uh, there are several mathematical aspects, I would say. Um, uh, one is the optimization aspect. So um, understanding the optimization methods for learning neural network, and these are usually gradient descent or uh, stochastic gradient descent, so mostly actually stochastic gradient descent. And um, what are generalization properties of deep neural networks? So, I mean, we learned this on these, on a particular set of uh, data, but then of course we want that, um, it, they also perform well on new data that we haven't seen yet. Uh, then there's also uh, approximation theory of deep neural networks. Um, I think in this, so, I mean, can we under, with a given with a neural network can we in principle approximate functions of interest and i think um, part of this has also been done in this community by trying to approximate solutions of parametric pdes using neural networks um, then stability properties um, and adapting network structures to specific tasks um, but uh, I will not go more into this, and you can imagine also other tasks that need to be understood here. Um, so this talk is about, um, well, these first two aspects, like uh, basically a combination of, of these. And so we will actually look at what, uh, what is called the implicit bias of certain op um, optimization algorithms. So, um, namely gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, and sometimes we will actually do some, um, well, abstraction and actually consider the gradient flow. Um, and uh, we will actually see in, well, maybe unexpected connection to low rank matrix recovery and uh, to also to compressive sensing. Okay, so just to set things up, I guess everybody of you is familiar with the basic setup. So um, what is a neural network? It's a composition of these, these layers, G1 to Gn, and uh, each layer is, is an um, affine function, which is described by some matrix Wj and some vector Bj, and then we apply on each component um, such a um, 
activation function, uh, I'll say the relu function or something like that. And uh, well, for simplicity, one can actually um, rewrite this slightly by introducing a new, new matrix and appending the data with a one at the, at the end and then actually, uh, I mean, omit these offsets, so which is um, why we often don't uh, speak about these BJs. Okay, and now the supervised learning setup, as, as you probably all know, uh, I mean, we are given uh, input and output pairs. And then the task is to find the parameters of a neural network such that we basically uh, match the uh, inputs to the outputs. And, uh, and then hopefully uh, once we learn such a neural network, it will perform well also on new data. And this is usually done by uh, done by empirical risk minimization. So we set up a so-called loss function, which uh, uh, basically specifies um, the distance between y l and f of x l, and then we um, sum up over all data points these distances or losses, and uh, well, and then we try to find um, the best neural network um, fitting the data. So, and now, um, yeah, what is usually done, we apply gradient descent in order to find, find the best parameters, so um, which, which looks like this. Okay, um, and now, the question is, um, yeah, do what are convergence guarantees? If we converge, uh, I mean, what what is um, the properties of the uh, of of the limit? Do we actually get the global minimizer, just the local minimizer, and so on? So, and well, one should in particular note that Alice, uh, this loss function is non-convex. Okay, so uh, this was the basic setup that probably. Um, you you have uh, you may have seen before and um, okay um, and uh, now let's let's come to some numerical experiments which when they first were performed the people were a bit puzzled about this so um, <clears throat> so here um, for these experiments they took. 50,000 training examples from the CIFAR-10 data set and uh, did training via SGD on, on several models. So on, on, several, um, uh, uh, on several architectures. And um, so these are the names. So this, it's not so important what actually is done. Uh, what I would like to point out is the number of, of parameters that, that we have here. So we have 50,000 training uh, samples, but then 1.2 up to almost 9 million uh, parameters, so quite some uh, over-parameterization. Um, so much more network parameters than training uh, data, and in fact, uh, when people train this, the training loss was in all these cases zero. So, and in particular, they found a global minimum because you cannot get smaller than zero with the training loss. And then, uh, of course, the question is then, uh, can we get also good generalization properties? And so here, uh, what they observed is that if you increase the, with the number of parameters, you actually increase the test accuracy, which is um, a bit puzzling, but because what um, classical statistics tells you is, is that uh, you should be in, a, in a, um, a range where you actually get overfitting. So more network parameters than training examples. And, and so you even, well, in, the amount of overfitting should actually be get larger and larger, but actually what happens is the opposite. That that I mean these these models be, behave quite well, and and this is one of the I guess puzzling questions why why overparameterized 
models work so well um, or can actually work so well. And um, well, just as a comparison, so um, I mean, compared to some um, other th uh, models, I mean, nine million parameters could be actually considered small. So the largest network that was ever trained, at least up to my knowledge, has 530 billion parameters. Um, I mean, I guess this was more like for a benchmark. I don't think you really need that large number of parameters, but okay, anyway. And um, yeah, so the question is what's, what's going on here? Um, they actually, these people actually did further experiments, which make the this, this story even a bit more puzzling. So you, you do the training with the true labels replaced by random labels. And then the trained networks are still able to interpolate exactly, so which leads to zero training error. So still you find some global optima, uh, optimum, but now the generalization area error is very large as you could expect because um, you basically fit the network to um, produce garbage. And, um, and but, but what, they, what they claimed in this paper is that uh, one has to rethink um, classical statistical learning theory where I mean one one can get generalization error bounds for instance via the Rademacher complexity or VC dimension for uh, for well I mean so one can get these error bounds but this would I mean these bounds would would be the same for the true uh, I mean for the scenario with the true labels and for the one with the random labels. And so they concluded since the performance is much better for the true labels, I mean, we have to rethink what's what's going on. Um, I mean, I, I'll come back to that point, point later. I, I don't think you really have to develop everything from scratch, but the question is of what do you actually compute the Rademacher complexity here? Okay. And okay, so, in this overparameterized scenario, what, what you will have is that you will have actually many networks interpolating the data. So you find a lot of networks that fit exactly the data. And this means also that um, your loss function has actually several, I mean, many global minimizers. And so the question is not um, so much whether you find a global minimizer, it's more like which one do you actually find? And in this scenario, the choice of the optimization algorithm poses some implicit bias towards certain solutions. So, I mean, the, the, the I mean, the, the lo looking at the loss function per se, I mean, does not tell you um, which which uh, solution is actually picked by the specific optimization algorithm. So th this is then called the implicit bias. And uh, by the optimization algorithm, I mean, that may also include um, the choice of the initialization and, and, and step sizes and so on. And uh, it seems that, I mean, to come back to this point with Rademacher complexity, that the set of implicitly favored networks, um, I mean, may have small Rademacher complexity. So that's, again, the standard theory uh, learning theory can be applied and and there have have been actually experiments on um, where people took um, I mean these authors took learned networks for I mean re, I mean learned on real data and then um, actually applied some compression techniques to each of the the matrix that they get and in fact they they uh, tensorized these matrices and uh, then applied some hierarchical tensor decomposition and compression to each of these matrices and observe that these matrices, I mean, these, the resulting networks perform basically in the same way as, as um, the original network. So which suggests that, that the actual complexity of what is, what is of these networks is much smaller. And if you, if you basically restrict to such 
networks with well small rank of these tensorized matrices then i mean the the theoretical bounds get much better but still um the question is why why gradient descent finds such networks in the first place and so I would say that understanding generalization error in deep learning requires understanding of the optimization algorithms for, for learning. And so this, in particular, um, gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, or like in an abstract way, one can also look at gradient flow for a first understanding. And so the question is, what is the implicit bias of these algorithms? By the way, um, People have also done, done experiments where they, where they replace gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent by different algorithms, some, sometimes much faster, but it turned out that the generalization properties of these algorithms are often much worse. So they find a different global optimum and which, which performs, I mean, which has weaker performance in practice. So in some sense, um, I mean, stochastic gradient descent is a very simple um, algorithm uh, which can be used for these settings with, with uh, big data. And, uh, but it also has like, seems to have nice properties in terms of Im uh, implicit bias. So in this in case, I would say that people were quite lucky when they uh, chose these, these algorithms. Okay. so. In order to approach an understanding here, we will actually pass to a simplified uh, setting, namely linear neural networks. Um, and so these are networks where we simply take as the activation function the identity. Uh, such networks may be not so interesting from an application point of view or in terms of, um, uh, in terms of um, approximation properties. But uh, still, the optimization part is non-trivial, and hopefully, I mean, getting ideas here, we can transfer them maybe later to, to uh, nonlinear neural networks. And like, um, it turns out that I mean, this is basically corresponding to a matrix factorization, and that then then we have actually an implicit bias towards uh, low rank solutions. So um, in some sense, or, and this is also my own working hypothesis, that the networks that are learned in practice do have some form of low complexity, which is imposed by graded descent. OK, so uh, let's consider linear networks. So uh, as I said, these are networks where the um, activation function is the identity. And so these are of, of these form. So we simply multiply all these weight matrices, and then at the end, we apply to, to the input. And of course, we can combine uh, all these matrices into one matrix, and uh, so we get a linear function. Um, so as I said, such linear function are, of course, not expressive enough for many applications, but still, uh, I mean, for studying the optimization part, um, uh, I think it's useful. And you can also view this factorization as an overparameterization of a single matrix. By the way, if, if the dimensions um, actually, um, I didn't write down, so, so the dimension here is, is uh, well, dj times dj minus one. And if, if uh, the dimensions are actually lower than than the the well the dimensions of this product matrix then we restrict the rank here um okay so there have been uh, some previous work well okay so what we will first do is we look at the convergence uh, of this gradient descent or a gradient gradient flow and um so there has been some work for linear nets, uh, but also for nonlinear nets in a limit of infinite widths. Um, yeah, okay, so just for, for completeness. And, and what we will consider as a loss function is actually the simple L2 loss. 
And so if we get data, which we collect into uh, some data matrix X and um, also the output data we select into, well, we combine into another matrix Y, then um, if we introduce this function L1W, um, so the, the N here stands always for the number of layers, then we can write this in this form, y minus wx um, in the Frobenius norm squared. And uh, now we introduce, well, we actually plug in such factorization into this L, L1 functional, and then we get a, get a functional on all these single matrices, which, which looks like this. Okay. And um, well, the point is that now, um, Ln is not jointly convex in this tuple of matrices. So at first you might say this seems a bit stupid. I start with a um, convex function and then I introduce this factorization and make it non-convex. But uh, still, um, I mean, there's some interesting effects happening. And what we will look at first is the gradient flow for learning these neural networks. So, I mean, and later on we, we pass to the gradient descent. So, I mean, for each uh, of these matrices, we introduce a time variable. And um, so that's then the gradient flow. And um, actually, um, you, we can rewrite this in terms of um, the gradient uh, with respect to the function L1, where we just have one matrix and it looks like this. Okay, and uh, and the point is, um, if we do this and then form again the product here of these single matrices, then I mean we again introduce a flow in in the product matrix, uh, but this is a different flow than the gradient uh, descent just for one matrix. So it's a it's a different uh, um, algorithm. And so the first question is uh, about the convergence. Does the flow converge to a critical point, local minimum, or even a global minimum of Ln? And, um, and for this, we introduce this product. So it's a product of these single matrices. And it turns out that we can also have an equation for, for this, this product matrix, which, which looks a bit complicated. So it's, it's like, like, like that. And, um, but in a, in a special case, if we assume that at initialization, we have the so-called balancedness condition, um, then um, I mean, this means that, okay, so if, if we have a product of, of this form, I mean, uh, I mean, if you are given, given uh, W, then of course there's some non-uniqueness in this decomposition. So we can, can always, um, we can always um, multiply at some point with, with, uh, with the matrix and then with the inverse matrix and then uh, get a new decomposition. And, or we could multiply one of the matrices with a scalar and the other one with the inverse of that scalar. And, and this, this condition basically uh, says that, uh, for instance, all the Frobenius norms of these single matrices are, are the same. So we have some sort of balancedness here. And in this case, we can actually simplify this equation um, for the flow of the product and uh, get, get this, uh, this relation here where, where you see that only the, the product itself enters. So we can write this as an equation just for, for the product. So the individual factors are not, not necessary anymore. Um, I mean, this is more a theoretical tool than one, what one would do in practice, because we have here these square roots of these matrices, but, but uh, for the theoretical reasons, this is useful. So we can introduce um, an operator, which is motivated by, by that equation. And then we can write like this, this, uh, this thing here in, in this form. And 
uh, one thing what we did is actually we interpreted this as a so-called Riemannian gradient flow. So we introduce um, the manifold of rank R matrices. And uh, well, this is the tangent space then of this, this manifold at a given matrix W. And now, um, so looking at this operator, when we restrict this to the tangent space, then it's actually um, a mapping from the tangent space into the tangent space. And it's a self-adjoint and positive definite map and therefore invertible. And uh, so we, we can in, uh, invert this restriction and define a bilinear map on the tangent space uh, like this. And that's actually introducing a Riemannian metric on um, the set of, um, uh, on the set of rank R matrices, which is actually of class C1. So that it's of class C1 is the non-trivial part here. Uh, well, you have also to do something to show that it's invertible, but um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's also of class C1. And uh, we can even write down an explicit formula for the Riemannian metric, which looks like this, but um, I mean, this is not so important for the following. And having this, we can now actually um, inter, well, interpret or write down the Riemannian gradient associated to this metric exactly in this form. And this means that the flow that we have is actually a Riemannian um, gradient flow for, for this function L1. Um, and so, so this means that the product also has some um, structure of a gradient flow, except that we have to change the, the metric. Okay. Um, let's omit that part. Um, okay, so now what, what's um, uh, happening with the convergence? So we assume that this data matrix, well, X, X transpose has full rank. So that's um, if you have random data, that's quite natural. And then um, one can show, first of all, show that these flows are defined for all T. And this tuple actually converges to a critical point of Ln as t goes to infinity. Um, just as a remark, so here we don't need this balancedness anymore. It's just for this Riemannian gradient flow interpretation. And um, just to say, I mean, the, the proof is based on, on the Lojasiewicz uh, theorem, which requires to show that like this tuple stays bounded. Um, this is a sort of the, yeah, some, somehow the non-trivial part because it's rather easy to show that the product is bounded, but then we need to show that also, also the factors um, in, of this product stay bounded. Um, okay, it generalizes some previous result by these people. Um, and now, okay, so, so we have convergence to a critical point, but then the question is, uh, yeah, is it, is it a global minimum? Is it a settled point? Um, some, some particular thing about this functional is that any a local minimizer is actually a global minimizer, which is, is a bit special here. So we just have to show that we don't get stuck in settled points. And, um, and this can be done. Um, for almost all initial values. So of course, if we start in a, in a saddle point, then we will never move with the flow. So uh, we have to exclude like some cases, but for almost all initial values, um, we have that this, this product actually converges to a global minimizer of L1, um, which will restrict to the manifold of matrices of rank K. Um, and the, the only thing that is not so nice um, about the theorem is that we cannot say what the rank is. So in principle, it can happen that we converge um, to the zero matrix, for instance. But um, yeah, we conjecture that the, that the rank will always be
be the maximal one. And only for n equals two, uh, then we really know that the flow converges to a global minimizer of Ln. Okay, so this is about convergence. So um, remember, we have a non-convex functional and still we, we showed a convergence to a global minimum. And uh, okay, one can also be interested, of course, in the gradient descent there. Um, so, so far, the gradient flow seems as, I mean, as an abstraction of the gradient descent, but uh, if we actually want to implement this, we have to think also about the step sizes. And here, um, so what happens in the gradient flow case is that actually, um, I mean, if we start with the balanced initial condition, also uh, like all the iterates stay, stay bounded, but this will not happen anymore in the discrete case. So we, we introduce something called the balancedness constant, which is sort of how much we dev deviate from this condition. And, um, so we could show that if uh, we have step sizes such that there is some diverges, so in particular this applies to constant step size, and the eta k is smaller uh, than, a, than an expression that depends only on yeah, basically the data, uh, then the sequence um, converges to a critical point of Ln, and all the iterates have balancedness constant delta. And from this, uh, well, once we have this, we can also show almost sure convergence to global minimizers. So, so that result extends from the gradient flow to the gradient descent as well. Um, I mean, this seems to be like a straightforward extension, but it was, in the end, it was much harder than we thought in the beginning. Um, well, simply because this balancedness will not be preserved. Okay, so this was about convergence, but let's now uh, come back to the, the implicit bias. Um, so let me first say a little bit about um, well, some background on low rank matrix recovery, because we would like to connect to that area. So here the task is to recover a matrix of small rank from linear measurements. So this is the extension of compressive sensing. So we get as information y equals this measurement map A applied to W. And we have less information. So this M is smaller than the matrix dimension. Okay. Um, now, if you want to solve this, uh, one approach is to minimize the rank subject to this uh, equality constraint, but that unfortunately is NP hard. And so the standard um, way is to actually do convex relaxation. And so we actually look at nuclear norm minimization. Um, so that's the L1 norm of this uh, vector of singular values of, of the, the matrix uh, Z. And um, here one can, I mean, one, one result in this, in this area is that we can recover the matrix if the number of measurements scales like the rank times the matrix dimension as well, times N1 plus N2. So that's... Um, it's much smaller than n1 times n2 if the rank is small. Um, okay, so nuclear norm minimization is successful. I mean, one can extend this. Let me skip this part and also uh, this part. Um, but okay, now seeing um, these matrix factorizations and linear networks, um, one can actually do the following. So we want to um, solve this equation, but for a low rank matrix W. So what we do now is we, um, we set up this functional. So Y minus A, and then instead of one matrix W, we plug in a product of matrices. And now we do gradient descent on all of these factors. So recall that this is different than doing the, just gradient descent on one matrix. Um, yeah, if, if uh, our factorization is 
such that um, it already restricts the rank, then, uh, okay, this is maybe not so interesting because by definition, we can only have a matrix of small rank. So what we um, do now is we simply take N by N matrices. So we've, all the matrices and the factorization will be N by N. And so the question is what happens then? And uh, if n equals one, so that's where we do not have overparameterization, then it's well known that uh, the gradient descent um, converges to the least square solution. So here we have uh, the minimizer of the Frobenius norm squared. And uh, this is not expected to give you anything of low rank. But uh, what happens if we actually do some factorizations? So here we did a numerical experiment. So we took a matrix, uh, well, try to recover a matrix of dimension 20 by 20 of rank two from Gaussian measurements. And uh, so we, well, we generated these measurements and um, did the strategy that I just explained and varied the number of measurements and repeated this several times and recorded the success prob probability. So here you, we increased the number of measurements. So if you reach 400, so 20 times 20 is 400. So that's uh, then a full set of measurements. Uh, but you see that, um, I mean, this, this blue curve here for n equals two, um, basically starting from whatever, 310 or so, um, this, this probability goes up, so we actually already recover low rank matrices, but this becomes much more pronounced if we factorize into more matrices. So here we have n equals uh, 3 and n, in, n equals 4, and you see that uh, basically, well, at around 80 measurements, um, we basically recover the uh, the original matrix and this is more or less the number of degrees of freedom of the matrix uh, of a matrix of rank two in dimension 20 times 20. so this this comes actually close to the to the limit what one could actually expect um, so it seems that uh, fact i mean these factorizations and then gradient descent um, uh, leads to, to low rank solutions. But the question is, can we actually, I mean, these are experiments. The question is whether we can explain this. And uh, so far, there are only partial answers to this. So, so we cannot yet explain this curve, but at least um, there's some first results available, which I would like to go over. So here's some, something on existing work. Um, so, um, yeah, so other people have done some work, but um, in, in my view, these are not, well, there's still some drawbacks of these works. For instance, some, uh, um, some assume that the measurement map, the, I mean, the measurement matrices or the measurements are actually commuting, which is a very restricted assumption. Um, okay, so uh, in order to approach this problem, we first uh, looked at actually a simpler problem, which is an estimation problem. So here we actually just have a, a given matrix W hat and then compare it with this um, factorization. So this, this map A is the identity. Of course, this is not really um, a, like, a, a, well, recovery problem where you have incomplete information, but um, yeah, but think of W as a perturbed um, uh, version of some true uh, matrix of low rank. Well, so the global, the set of global minimizers are all tuples that such that their product equals W hat. And so um, we already know that the gradient flow um, converges to a global optimizer for almost all initializations. But what will now be uh, the point is to look at, I mean, how this uh, convergence actually happens. And uh, so what um, we look at is, well, for the 
initialization, we take actually alpha times the identity with alpha small. So this is also something in general that people observe in machine learning, that they have to take initializations, which are actually rather small. Um, so so we, we do this. And so here's what, what actually um, happens in an experiment. So, so here's uh, a well, picture from this MNIST database, like, um, like a one, but, but uh, well, quite much um, noise here. So this is basically when you have, you have converged and it's just uh, one of the images that we have put together in, uh, well, as, as reshaped as columns of a matrix and then uh, put that as W hat. And if N is e equal one, you just observe that, well, at some point you converge to what you have put into. But now if you actually do N equals two or three, um, you see that in the intermediate range, actually, I mean, the noise seems to be removed. And, but when you continue at some point, you converge to, I mean, uh, this noisy image. And this is also, um, well, what's happening for N equals three. So um, one way to explain this is to look at the singular values. And so if N equals one, and you look at all the singular values during the optimization, like they basically also all go up in, in a very similar fashion. But if you look at, well, let's look at this at n equals four. So what you see is that here, first, this first eigenvalue goes up. And now um, you have some time where basically only one of the singular values is active and the remaining ones are very small. So basically you have a rank one solution for, for this time. And then here you have a rank two solution and, and so on. So it seems that this factorization leads to the fact that that I mean the I mean if you look at the uh, at the dynamics like the the first singular values are preserved uh, first and so you get actually low rank um, approximations on on the way. And uh, I mean okay this is a similar plot for the effective rank but okay let me skip over that. Um, so here, um, okay, so again, this is the, is the um, setup. We actually assume that W hat now is symmetric and um, okay, and, and we look at this gradient descent and, uh, and the product and and it turns out that if we initialize with alpha times the identity that um, well actually the dynamics only happens on the diagonal part so so these these eigenspaces uh, remain constant and therefore we only need to follow the the diagonals and so this means that I mean, we can look at all the diagonals uh, separately, so they decouple, and, and so this is the equation for one diagonal entry, and uh, the corresponding eigenvalue of the ground truth is this lambda, and then I can also abstract going to the gradient flow for this. So, the, so we have a very explicit differential equation we have to solve, and in fact, um, well, at least an implicit solution can be given. Uh, okay, so again, here's the numerics for, for these two, um, well, for, for this, this equation now and for different values of lambda and different values of n. So again, you see this effect that I just pointed out. And, um, and you also see what happens with the approximation error. So, so actually the, approximation error has this, well, I mean, one could say waterfall behavior that, uh, I mean, for some time you actually stay more or less constant. Uh, this is where you have a, an approximation of a certain rank and then at some point you reach the next rank and, and so on. And uh, as I said, we can actually explicitly or implicitly solve this equation and then from that on, um, yeah, do some analysis, for instance, say, give, give some intervals 
um, in which actually the the effective rank of um, this um, gradient flow um, well if approximates the the effective rank of the rank L truncation uh, very well. Um, Okay, and uh, so this is for the gradient flow, but we can also do this for the gradient descent by comparing essentially to the gradient flow. Okay, um, yeah, so this, this result is a bit technical, but um, so I spare you the details, but um, so if, if you compare the, the um, the theoretical predictions uh, for the gradient flow and for the gradient descent with the true behavior, we get quite accurate um, results. Okay. Um, and well, what we cannot treat is actually random initialization, which is would also be nice. Um, but um, basically it seems that uh, what we ob observe also happens for, for random Gaussian initialization with, with a small scale. But uh, this is uh, unfortunately something we cannot treat yet. Okay, and now as a final um, part, I would like to um, say something about implicit bias towards sparse solutions or um, well, you could say low rank of for diagonal matrices. And so here we will actually go, go to the compressive sensing problem. And so we would like to recover a sparse vector X from this incomplete information, Y equals AX. And the standard approach that you probably all know is L1 minimization. Um, so we try to find the L1 minimizer. And, but what we all will do now, uh, we try to follow a similar approach as just now by doing an overparameterization or a factorization, uh, now not for matrices, but for vectors. So let's introduce this uh, square loss. So AX minus Y. And now instead of just plugging in one vector, we actually take N vectors that we multiply. So this is just a pointwise multiplication. So basically we write each entry of the vector as a product of, of numbers. And we can do this in this way, but it turns out that if we do it in this way, we can only recover positive entries. And uh, in order to also recover negative entry, we need to uh, basically subtract two of these representations from each other. Okay, and now what we do, we actually look at the gradient flow for, for this func these functionals. And um, so if you do not um, factorize, just as a reminder, um, then we actually get convergence to the least square solutions uh, solution. So X of T converges to the um, L2 minimizer subject to that constraint. So that doesn't promote sparsity. And what we do now is, I mean, look at the gradient flow for this first case. Um, so this was uh, this equation and also for, for this one. And the initialization will be always alpha times a vector of just once. So we take um, alpha as the initialization for each entry, and that also will happen for the U case and V case. And then the question is, does the product converge or also this, this expression? And what are the properties of the limit? And now here, we can actually find, find a relation to L1 minimization, which is um, quite explicit. So we assume that we have more than two or more layers and that this set, I mean, now this is about recovery of positive um, solutions. So we assume that at least there is one positive solution. And then uh, these limits exist. So we have convergence of this product flow. 
and let now um, well C plus be actually the L1 norm of the L1 minimizer subject to that constraint. And now if the uh, initialization scale alpha is small enough, so smaller than this expression in terms of this L1 norm and some epsilon, then we get that the L1 norm of the limit and the um, this uh, C plus is actually less, uh, I mean, the one norm of this minimizer is less or equal to epsilon. Okay, so this means, yeah, okay, we, we make a, um, well, make a connection to the actual recovery then uh, later on, um, or in two slides. Um, and uh, but we also can can do this for recovery of arbitrary vectors so now we just assume that like we have at least one solution and then we get again get convergence of of this expression here as t goes to infinity and uh, we know that the limit is contained in this set and again if alpha is small enough then also we have like that these the l1 norm of um this limit and the L1 norm of the L1 minimizer is, is very close to each other. And now we can connect this to results uh, known from compressive sensing. For instance, we can choose A as a Gaussian matrix. So just as an example, so if we have these number of measurements and um, then um, if alpha is actually small enough, then um then we get that oh, and this is the error of best s term approximation then we get that the difference of the actual x and the limit um, of this gradient flow can be bounded in this way so if we have actually a sparse vector then this term cancels and we just get an error by essentially epsilon Okay, so basically the, the limit here converges to um, a sparse solution or approximately a sparse solution, which uh, I mean is a bit unexpected because we never know where is something sparsity is built and explicitly in, in, in one of these, these functions. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe I'm already a bit over time, so let's skip this. So, of course, there are a lot of open questions. So, um, yeah, I mean, we still have some conjecture here. And and then this this uh, story of the implicit bias, I mean, we, we have it now. I think we understood it in terms of L1 minimization, sparse recovery, but there are many cases we did not yet understand. And, of course, the most interesting thing would be to extend all these things to nonlinear networks, but I think that that still requires a lot of thinking. Okay, um, that was it. Thanks very much for your attention.